Thank you, Pierre. So, traditionally, cryptography treats the problem of communication between two parties over an, a public channel. And we assume there exists an adversary listening to this communication, and we build schemes such that the adversary can get no information about the message transmitted. However, now encryption is used in more complicated ways, such as satisfying access policies or identity-based encryption or attribute-based encryption. In this work, we focused on something that has been given much attention recently, which is computations on encrypted data. The main idea is that it should be possible to publicly learn the a property on a massive data set by only looking at the encrypted data elements. So suppose you have a server that has stored a bunch of ciphertexts, and we would like to allow the server, without being able to decrypt, to execute uh, various computations like inde indexing or range queries or data clustering, keyword search, or general computations. Related works to this notion are uh, format-preserving encryption, public key encryption with keyword search, and others. But the notion that inspired our work, our line of work, is uh, order-preserving encryption it introduced in 2009 by Boldireva, Chenet, Lee, and O'Neill. In the order-preserving encryption setting, the message space, the plain text space, admits a partial ordering, and the scheme is built in such a way that the encrypted ciphertexts admit the same, the same partial order. So essentially, the, compu the computation that the server can execute here is to compare the ciphertexts and deduce something about the partial ordering of the messages. However, these guys showed that in order to get strong security guarantees from such schemes, the ciphertext space has to be very sparse. And actually, it has to be so sparse that the schemes would be totally impractical. So they proved that either we get strong, strong security guarantees, like INDCPA security, and the size of the ciphertext space is exponential in the size of the message space, Therefore, the scheme would be impractical. And or they assumed that the plaintext distributions have sufficiently high mean entropy. So they considered this weaker security notion where the messages to be encrypted are sufficiently random. And inspired by this work, we asked if there are properties or schemes with no such restrictions, namely practical schemes but with strong security guarantees. So the first step to generalize this notion of property preserving encryption is to generalize the, the notion of a property. We define the property to be a function on k messages, which outputs uh, 0 or 1. Our property preserving encryption schemes contain the three usual algorithms, setup, encryption, and decryption and a new algorithm called test, which acts on k ciphertexts and outputs 0 or 1. As you might have guessed, the testing algorithm should output the same value as the property we have decided at the beginning of our scheme. Namely, if you apply the testing algorithm on k ciphertexts, it should give you uh, the property p on the corresponding k uh, plain texts. And this is the second generalization we considered here. So notice that in order preserving encryption, the testing algorithm was the, the, in, the, the, the testing algorithm there was the comparison of the ciphertext. So the test and the property were the same. However, in our case, we allow the testing algorithm on the ciphertext to be something different. We just require that it outputs the same property. And since, uh, since we require that this algorithm is publicly computable, we, we need uh, to use a symmetric key encryption. Because if we allowed someone to encrypt using a, a public key, 
And then he would be able to create a ciphertext for any message. And for non-trivial properties, he would be able to use the testing algorithm and extract too much information from a challenge ciphertext using the ciphertext he created. So we stick to the setting of symmetric key encryption. And let's see our main goal, our strong security that I mentioned. This is a, a security notion we adapted from a paper by Bellard, Desai, Jokip, and Rogoway. This was a work on symmetric key encryption, and it was called left or right security. In this security game, the challenger picks a side, uniformly or random, at BB, either left or right, and returns the encryptions of either the left messages or the right messages. You will see how that works. First, he gives the public parameters to the adversary, and the adversary makes queries of that form, pairs of plain texts. Depending on the bit B, the challenger returns the ciphertext of either the left or the right message. And this continues for a polynomial number of steps. At the end of the game, the adversary has either encryptions of all the left messages or all the right messages and tries to guess the bit B and break the scheme. Now, since in property preserving encryption, the adversary is allowed to learn the value of the property on any k subset of plain texts, we have to impose the following so-called equality pattern restriction. This says that if you pick any subset of k messages on the left sequence and you apply the property p on them, it should give you the same result as if you apply the property on the same subset on the right sequence. If there is restriction where and true, the adversary would be able to use the testing algorithm and break the scheme trivially. However, the, so this is our main goal, to build practical schemes that satisfy this security notion. However, the problem with this notion is that it has so many challenge pairs. And we considered a simple security notion. Again, it was introduced in the same work called find then guess security, or in other works, single challenge security, which has only one challenge pair. So again, the challenger picks a side B. And now the adversary is allowed to make single message queries at first. The challenger responds with the ciphertext of the message. And this continues for as long as the adversary wants. At only one point, the adversary is allowed to make a challenge query that contains two messages. And now, depending on the bit B, the challenger returns the correct ciphertext, either the left or the right. After that, the adversary makes another single message query phase. And as before, we have to impose a similar restriction on the left and the right sequence, where the left and the right sequence here is the one that uh, consists of the single messages, the left challenge message, and the single messages after, after the challenge pair, and the right sequence accordingly. So initially in our work, we tried to prove using a hybrid argument that these two notions were, uh, were equivalent. That's what these guys did in the standard symmetric key notion. And if we could do that, we would be able to get left or right security by only proving FTG security. However, we discovered surprisingly that this is not possible for property preserving encryption. The intuition behind that is that uh, in the left or right security game, it might be the case that the left sequence is not reachable from the right sequence using only one step changes, one message changes. Changes. And this depends on the property at hand. So in this case, we say that the two sequences here have the same equality pattern, but they belong to different uh, reachability classes. Other, other way, another way to see this is that the FTG security notion says that two sequences are indistinguishable when they differ only in one message. This one, the challenge message here. 
Therefore, they ha although they have, the same, they have the same equality pattern and the same reachability class, while left or right security says something stronger that all sequences with the same equality pattern are indistinguishable. And this is the main, th the main result of our work, that in property preserving encryption, the left or right security is strictly stronger than find and guess security. And by generalizing the notion of find and guess security by allowing more challenge pairs, constant number of challenge pairs, we discover that there exists an entire hierarchy of strictly stronger notions of security. In the following slides, I will present the proof of the first theorem, the, FT, the separation result between FTG and left or right. As usual, we assume there exists an FTG secure scheme pi, and we construct a new scheme pi star, which is FTG secure, but not left or right secure. To do that, the first step is to define the message space and the property P that is to be tested. So our message space consists of the integers modulo a prime P, and we know that the set of quadratic residues, the squares modulo P, can be defined, and the set of quadratic non-residues, the remaining elements. And from number theory, we know the following fact, that if a number is the product of two other numbers in ZP star, then this number is a square if and only if both factors are in QR or both factors are in QNR. We're going to use this fact in the following slides, in the proof. So the, the, the property that our scheme preserves, the scheme pi, uh, is similar to this uh, theorem. It takes two messages, x and y, and outputs one if and only if their product is a quadratic residue. And as I told you, we assume that pi is FTG secure on this property P. Now, we have to create a new scheme pi star such as the, that it is FTG secure but not left or right secure. To do that, we define the setup algorithm. It calls the setup of the original scheme and samples a random bit T from zero or one, uniformly at random. I will be referring to this bit as the one-time pad. You will see in a second why. The encryption algorithm calls the encryption of the original scheme and outputs the ciphertext CT. And every time it is called, it samples a random bit B. If B equals zero, it outputs the ciphertext, the value of the bit B, and the one-time pad T. Otherwise, it outputs the ciphertext, the bit B, and the one-time pad must with the sign of the message to be encrypted, where the sign is this function similar to the Legendre symbol, which tells you whether the message is a quadratic residue or not. So essentially, the one-time pad here masks the sign of the, of the message. Now let's see why this scheme is FTG secure. As usual, we have to build a, an attacker for pi using an attacker on pi star. The, the FTG security game is shown here. We have a single message queries, a challenge pair, and then again, single message queries. And according to our equality pattern restriction for the property at hand, for the property for quadratic residuosity, it should be true that uh, if you apply the property on a single message and the left challenge message, it should give you the same value as uh, the right side. Now let's see what this means for, this, for our attacker and this specific property. In case one where the signs of the challenge messages are the same, we can have single messages because if this is, for example, a quadratic residue, you get the same result for the product in both sides. However, in case two, where, the si where you have a quadratic residue on one side and a quadratic non-residue in the other side, if we had a single message here, and let's say this was a quadratic residue, their pro the product would give you one in one side and zero on the other side, and according to the theorem I showed you. Therefore, in this case, no single message queries are allowed by our assumed attacker. So to build the simulator for, uh, 
the Pi scheme. Here is on the encryption of Pi star in compact form. Depending on the case, the simulator acts differently. So in the first case, where the challenge messages have the same size, our simulator picks the one time pad himself and simulates the game perfectly by answering all single message queries. He can do that because he knows their sign. And the challenge query as well. Again, he knows uh, the sign of the message that is encrypted. He doesn't know which message is encrypted here, the left or the right. But since the sign is the same for both left and right, he's OK. And for the second case, where the signs of the two messages are different, the simulator responds to the only one query with a CT and two uniformly random bits. And since the, the attacker has seen only this ciphertext, these are uniformly distributed. Because as I told you, in case two, he gets no ciphertext for, from single message queries. Therefore, pi star is FTG secure. Sorry. Now, to conclude the proof, we have to give an attack for the left or right security. And the attack is obvious. The attack is obvious. In one side, we can query for all quadratic residues, and in the other side, for only quadratic non residues. This is a valid attack because if you pair any two in one side, you get a QR. And in the left side as well. If you, pair, if you multiply a quadratic non residue with another non residue, you get a square, a quadratic residue. And it's successful because with very high probability, the attacker will get a ciphertext where b equals zero, he will get the one time pad t. And using another ciphertext well, where b equals 1, he can deduce the sign of the messages and check whether it's on the right side or the left side. And that's the proof. That concludes the proof of our main theorem. For the hierarchy, we, use a, we follow a similar way. We assume there exists an FTG and secure scheme pi, where n is a constant in integer. And we construct a scheme pi star with the required properties. I won't go into the details of that proof. The, the two cases are similar. We have a case one where single messages are allowed, but all signs are the same. And case two where only challenge queries are allowed, and all signs in each pair are different. However, notice here that our simulator in this case has to output ciphertext for both quadratic residues and quadratic non-residues. And therefore, the extension from the previous reduction is not that trivial. But the main ideas are similar. So in this case, we use an end time pad to encode information about sign. Uh, in case one, we simulate the game perfectly. And in case two, we output suitable random integers. We have correct simulation until n challenge queries. And if we allow n plus 1 challenge queries, we get a break with constant probability. There are other security notions as well that we considered, but I will not go into them. And I will not switch to the constructions of the schemes. So for unary properties, there is a trivial generic construction. Just include the property p in the ciphertext. For binary properties, there is a generic construction as well using predicate encryption. However, to get left or right security, it requires very strong security guarantees from the predicate encryption scheme, which are not known to exist for non-trivial properties. Therefore, in our paper, we presented an explicit construction for testing orthogonality. And finally, for ternary properties and above, it is still an open problem. I will go through our explicit construction quite quick. So our, our scheme works in uh, bilinear groups of composite order, where the, the order is product of two prime numbers. And therefore, we get two subgroups, G0 and G1, where if we assume that these are the generators, then this independence property is satisfied. If you pair an element of the first subgroup to an element of the second subgroup, you get one. 
the property, as I told you, the property that our construction preserves is the orthogonality of n-dimensional vectors. These are the messages of our scheme. And it outputs zero if and only if their inner product is zero. Now let's see how our construction works. To create the secret key, we pick two generators, G0 and G1, of the respective subgroups. And m plus 1 exponents such that v square is equal to the sum of the squares of t. For the encryption of a message A, we just pick two random exponents and output this huge ciphertext. Notice that the components of the message are only exponents in the first subgroup, while the components of the secret key are used as exponents in the second subgroup. For the testing algorithm, you just get two ciphertexts, and you just pair the respective components together. If you do the math, from the first pairing, you get e of g1, g1 to the rr plus v square, while for the, from the product of the n remaining pairings, you get e of g0, g0 to something that has the inner product of the two messages in the exponent, and e of g1, g1 to the rr prime to the sum of the t's. Therefore, according to the way we picked our secret key, these two parts are equal. And our testing algorithm can compare this term with this term and deduce whether the two messages are orthogonal by, by, knowing, by not knowing any secret information, just by executing pairings. I will conclude the talk with the new directions for property preserving encryption, which are numerous, as you can see. There are many interesting properties, like ternary properties, arithmetic progressions, or ge geometric shapes. And we suggest using lattices, since pairings seem suitable only for binary properties. And there are many applications for property preserving encryption, like privatizing popular algorithms, such as clustering or data classification. Finally, uh, final direction is to generalize the properties to functions, so the properties output only 0 or 1. In, instead of that, we can have a function there that outputs a specific value, and then we would get powerful public computations on encrypted data. And that's all. Thank you. So we have time for a quick question. Yes? In your separation result, you assume the existence of, uh, of a scheme that's secure with respect to a particular property, right? It's not yes. that you can... The reason I'm asking is because you require some amount of computation on ciphertext on one hand. On the other hand, this notion cannot be secure for a public key encryption. And the third thing is for schemes that allow computation of interesting functions on ciphertext, you can prove that symmetric key and public key are equivalent. The might, it's plausible that you can combine these three uh, in order to show that you actually cannot have a secure property preserving for interesting properties or for smooth enough properties or whatever, um, which, in, if that's true, that would render the separation result mute because it just says that the property you assume exists cannot exist in a secure scheme. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that, my, my question is, was, I don't know what the question is, whether you looked at uh, trying to prove that certain properties cannot have, um, it, it seems plausible that you can show that, is essentially what I'm saying. That certain properties, that in, interesting enough properties cannot have a secure encryption scheme associated with them. Well, so what's the question, the exact question? <laughs> If we looked into that, yeah, I mean, w do you know anything about showing uh, our that main focus certain properties have or don't don't have uh, secure encryption associated with them? Uh, no, we didn't look all properties, but our main focus was to show that there is no general way to go from one notion to the other. That there exists but, some properties. Such but that, that that's only under the assumption that specific properties do have encryption, yes, a secure yes. encryption scheme. Okay. I mean, in order to prove the separation, we had to assume that an FTG secure scheme existed. For that property? Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
looked at properties that are sort of efficiently testable? Because this property wasn't efficiently testable, right? Or uh, this the property? The orthogonality property? <laughs> the, the quadratic or residuosity property that you had. It is efficiently oh, testable. Oh, sorry. There was, okay, maybe I just looked at the wrong thing. It only used pairings and mul multiplications. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. I want to know whether we're any closer, given your result, to practical um, order preserving encryption. Uh, can you repeat the question? I couldn't hear you. Given your results, are we any closer to a practical order preserving encryption, OPE? Uh, not yet. No. Thank you. So one quick question, for your um, separation, did you need quadratic residuosity or could you have just done it with normal encryption and have the property be the last bit? Like the last yes. bits are the same. Yes, uh, we didn't okay. need it. We, we just needed a property that had the same, that worked the same way as quadratic residuosity. Okay, so you can get from just any encryption. Scheme, yeah. Right? We just wanted to have a, to show a concrete property. Any other question? No, so let's uh, Yanis again and hold the speaker of this session.